Today I've come out to Nevada to take a look at the biggest, baddest Mustang that they've ever built, the all-new 2020 Shelby GT500. 760 horsepower, a unique dual-clutch transmission under the hood, and quarter-mile times well under 11 seconds. If you're a professional driver and you can get the launch just right, because like all other Mustangs available in America, this is still rear-wheel drive. Up front, we definitely get a different look than the regular Mustangs. Some of this is based on the cooling requirements for the massive engine that we find under the hood, and some of it is aerodynamic. So we have the splitter down there at the bottom. This one has the optional carbon fiber package on it, so the splitters are a little bit different as we look around the vehicle than the rest of the GT500 lineup. We have a GT500 logo right there, large mesh grill right there for all of that cooling that's required, HID headlamps up front. I'm a little bit disappointed that these didn't turn into LEDs some distinctive accent lights, and then turn signals there as well. You'll also notice if you look really closely that the front end of this vehicle has become a little bit wider, and that's because the track and the overall width of the Mustang is wider for the GT500 to accommodate the wider tires. If we take a closer look at the headlight, you'll notice what's going on here. This is very similar to what we see in the Ford Raptor pickup truck. So this is the same headlamp basic design that we find in the regular Mustang, but this much body has been added to it on each side. They've done a really good job of integrating some of these same parts with the rest of the Ford lineup with a unique body. So the quarter panels, fenders, etc., those are all different for the GT500, and then you get that extra width as a result. This definitely looks a lot more cohesive in terms of the wide body kit than what we see in the Dodge lineup. On top of the hood, we have this very dramatic louvered grill right here. It is fully functional in the GT500. It helps improve cooling and it helps release pressure that builds up right there in the engine compartment because all that air is going in the front, has to go out somewhere, and you don't want it to exhaust underneath the vehicle because that would give the vehicle lift. And instead, Ford is really interested in downforce because of the top speed that this vehicle is capable of. We also see these stripes right here. These are the vinyl stripes on the GT500. They're $1,000, so a little bit less expensive than the stripes we see on the Dodge Challenger. And if you want the painted version, then it's gonna be significantly more expensive, $10,000 if you want the stripes painted on rather than a vinyl applique. We also see something else up here that we don't see in some of the competition, which are these extra hood releases. So we release the hood from the inside, we then pop those buttons in, and then we can open the hood. It gives the hood a little bit of extra security if you are on a drag strip or you're tracking your vehicle, and you wanna be sure that the hood is firmly closed and isn't just gonna fly up on you. For 2020, the Mustang is available in no less than seven different power levels, from 310 horsepower to 332 horsepower with the base 2.3 liter turbocharged engine, to the classic Mustang GT available with either 460 or 480 horsepower thanks to a naturally aspirated 5 liter V8. Those are the two classic variants of the Mustang. Of course, if you want real Mustang performance, then you step up into the GT trims of Mustang. The GT350 will give you 526 horsepower out of a new 5.2 liter crossplane V8 that is distantly related to the 5.0 but not really the same sort of thing. 527 horsepower if you get the GT350R, or this big boy right here, the GT500. This uses a 5.2 liter supercharged V8 engine. It is related to the 5.2 and the GT350, but they tell us that very few components are directly shared between the two engines. That's because this one produces 760 horsepower and a whopping 625 pound-feet of torque. Clearly horsepower is a significant improvement over the GT350, but I think the more impressive improvement is the torque figure. Because the GT350 and GT350R don't really produce that much more torque than the 5 liter V8, because they're naturally aspirated models. But thanks to the supercharger we find under here, nestled right there in the valley of the V, provided by Eaton Superchargers, we get 625 pound-feet of torque, a pretty significant bump over the GT350. And now it's time for the numbers. Zero to 60 happens in 3.3 seconds for a stock GT500. Quarter miles happen in 10.7 seconds at over 130 miles an hour if all the stars align and again you're down there closer to sea level. But those are not the impressive numbers for me. The most impressive number, I think, is the zero to 100 to zero time in this vehicle of 10.6 seconds. There are very few vehicles out there that can do a quarter mile time as fast as this GT500. We're talking about incredibly expensive models like a Ferrari 488, an Audi R8 V10 Plus, a Lamborghini Huracan, or of course a Tesla Model S, although it's worth noting that the Model S wouldn't have a trap speed as high as this Mustang. So it'll definitely go a little bit faster in the quarter mile as far as time goes, but speed by the end of that quarter mile will be below 130 miles an hour. 
And then if we're talking about zero to 100 to zero times, there are even fewer vehicles out there that will post better numbers than this Mustang right here. And this is one of the differentiators between the GT500 and something like a Hellcat. The zero to 100 to zero time is definitely gonna be longer over there in the Dodge lineup. Other Mustang models feature a six-speed manual transmission or a 10-speed traditional automatic transmission. The GT500 doesn't use either of those options. Instead, we get a standard seven-speed dual-clutch transmission made by Tremec. This is a wet dual-clutch transmission, and honestly, it's one of the best that I've ever driven. Now, why did Ford give us a seven-speed DCT rather than a traditional automatic? Well, the main reason is overall shift speed. This DCT can shift faster than Ford's 10-speed auto. And the difference gets larger when we're talking about non-sequential shifts. So just going from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the 10 speed is slower than this. It's not a huge amount slower, but when we're talking about really skipping around the gear ratios, the DCT is definitely going to be faster. And it's going to give you a much more engaging feel, much more like a traditional manual transmission, since it is a manual that is just shifted by a robot. Why didn't Ford give us a traditional manual transmission? Well, the easy answer is the GT500 wouldn't be this fast if you were shifting the gears by yourself. At 190.2 inches long, the GT500 is about two inches longer than a regular Mustang EcoBoost or Mustang GT. That's primarily due to the cooling demands for this engine, so most of that difference happens right there up front. Other than that, the side profile of the GT500 looks just like the rest of the Mustang lineup. But looks can be deceiving because the front quarter panels and the rear quarter panels back here are unique to the GT500 because we have the much wider tires on this model. So they've given us fender flares up front and in the back. But again, they've done this a little bit differently than Dodge did with the Challenger wide body. So instead of just sticking on some plastic or fiberglass fender flares, they've actually changed the sheet metal on this car. Another thing you'll notice from the side profile is that this particular model does have the optional carbon fiber package, which means we get these exposed carbon fiber wheels that helps improve the weight of the wheel themselves. And then we have this massive wing right here at the back. The GT500 already comes with a pretty big wing, but the carbon fiber track package bumps it up to the next level. Wrapped around these carbon fiber wheels, Ford decided to go for a staggered tire setup. So we have 305s up front, 315s in the back. I was a little bit surprised by that, however, because the 5.2 liter supercharged engine is definitely gonna be heavier than something like the Mustang 5 liter V8. So I had expected them to put more symmetrical tires on the car. Ford partnered with Michelin for the tires on all GT500 trims. There are two different tires available. There's the Pilot Sport 4S tire that you'll find on the base GT500. If you get the carbon fiber track package, which is again what this model has, then we get the Pilot Sport Cup 2 tires, which are definitely a track focused tire. These are about as close as you can get to a racing slick that is still street legal. You can really see that with the tread pattern here, where on the outside, there aren't a lot of grooves going on. That gives you more surface area to apply the power to the rear, more handling ability in dry weather conditions out on a track. And of course, no performance vehicle would be complete without absolutely massive front brakes. At 16.53 inches, these are among the largest brakes you will find in any two-door vehicle in the world. These have 25% more thermal absorption capability than the brakes we see on the GT350. And if you wanna go even crazier, there's a carbon ceramic brake upgrade. With 760 horsepower under the hood, rear wheel drive, and a Ford logo on the Mustang GT500, I know that everybody is going to want to compare this to a Dodge Challenger Hellcat. But hear me out, they're quite different vehicles. The extra weight and the extra size means that the Challenger is quite a different vehicle out on a track. Now, if you're drag stripping the vehicles, then logically you could compare this to something like that Dodge Challenger, especially in the red eye version, which has 797 horsepower and helps compensate a little bit for the added weight we see in the Challenger, especially when you're taking a look at those quarter mile times. But when you get these two vehicles out on a track or out on your favorite winding mountain road, it's a completely different thing. The Mustang simply feels lighter and more nimble. Comparisons are important and of course inevitable, but I'm just gonna start this video out here by saying that they're just not the same kind of vehicle. Now there are definitely some fast Camaros, but none of the Camaros will give you the same kind of horsepower that we see in this vehicle, and none of them will give you a DCT like we find under this hood. The biggest thing you'll notice out back is again, this absolutely enormous spoiler back here. If you were to get the regular GT500, then you'd get one that's a little bit more discreet than what's going on here. This is all in exposed carbon fiber, which is definitely very trendy right now. But aside from that, the rest of the back looks very much like the rest of the Mustang family. Again, even though these side quarter panels are not the same. We also get a unique exhaust setup down here with these large quad exhaust tips right down there at the bottom and some definite aero treatment going on. You'll also Notice we have a cutout for a European license plate because we do expect this to be sold around the world. 
Front seat comfort is good in the model that we're driving here. This has the optional Recaro seats in it. If we get the base GT500, then we get a power driver seat available. This is a manual seat since this is the Recaro. Overall, the seating position and the overall interior is basically the same as the rest of the Mustang lineup, just as we see in most performance versions of regular mainstream vehicles. So if you like or don't like the interior of the Mustang GT or the GT350, then you're probably going to like or not like the GT500. Just apply those opinions straight to this particular vehicle. We do have a tilt telescopic steering column with a decent range of motion and a slightly different wheel for this model. I've hopped in the back really quick to show you what this looks like. This model has the rear seat delete, but we still have an escape handle right here for the front seats. Obviously, there are no shoulder belts or seat belts back here. You're not supposed to put anybody back here because this doesn't have the rear seats. But in case you've ever wondered what a rear seat delete looks like in a modern vehicle, this is exactly what's going on in here. Instead of the seat fabric or seat consoles or seat belts or anything like that, we just get extra carpet. But because this is a mainstream vehicle that was originally designed for extra seats, interestingly enough, we still have things like the latch anchor points right back there on each side, and we still have the little slots where the seat belts would go through on each side. Another thing that's the same as the rest of the Mustang lineup is the trunk. We have the same just over 13 cubic feet of storage space back here that we find in the rest of the Mustang lineup. That means you'll have no problem putting two people's worth of luggage in here, especially considering that this is a two seat vehicle only. Taking a closer look at the inside, you can see that Shelby logo right there on the Recaro seats and the seat back. You see that we have pretty aggressive side bolsters on this design and that Recaro logo right there on that side bolster. The seats feature a combination of different materials and we have that suede-like center section right there. Imitation suede has definitely been getting better over time, but these still may not wear quite as well as a traditional leather seat. If you don't get the optional Recaro seats, then we get a driver and front passenger seat that are much more like the average Mustang seat. And I have to say that this would definitely be my preference for the GT500. If you get this particular seat, then it is leather upholstered, it is powered on the driver's side, manual on the passenger side, and it's heated and ventilated for both the front seat positions. That two-tone design continues as we move on over to the doors, but the door panels themselves are very much the same as every other Mustang out there. That goes really for the bulk of this interior. Since we're driving the model with the carbon fiber package, we have the carbon fiber trim on the inside, and you can see that we have that GT500 logo right there around the passenger airbag. You can see that we do have a chassis number right there. This is chassis number 25. But overall, the shapes and overall sizes, quality of parts, etc., are all basically the same as the rest of the Mustang lineup. Right here in the center of the dashboard, we have an oil pressure gauge and an oil temperature gauge right next to these two air vents. Above those two gauges, we have a center channel speaker since this does have the optional B&O surround sound system. And then we have a color touchscreen infotainment system. As you can see, it features smartphone integration just like the rest of the Ford lineup. One odd tweak, however, is that if you have a smartphone like that connected, you can't use the factory's navigation system, which I think is a little bit of a pity. Below the infotainment system, we have some physical buttons, volume over here, power button right there in the center, dedicated track forward backward buttons. We then have the controls for the dual zone automatic climate control, the engine start stop button. This toggle is for the hazard lights. This one is for the traction control. We then have a button for the exhaust mode and then a toggle for the drive mode right there. The drive mode combines all the various systems that can be adjusted in the vehicle. We then have a single USB input right here in this area and just barely enough room for some of those larger smartphones. This does interact with the smartphone integration feature. A rotary shift knob. This has been a little bit controversial in the GT500. Honestly, I don't understand why. I couldn't care less what the shifter in a modern vehicle like this looked like as long as it shifts. Drive is over there on that side. Park is over there on this side. You can also park the vehicle by turning it off and it will automatically park itself. If you're in drive and you want to engage the manual mode, we just hit the manual button in the center and we use the paddles on the back of the steering wheel. On either side of those two large cup holders, you can see again some of that matching trim that matched the seat designs. So we have these two different colors going on here. And then we have a fairly small storage compartment right here between the front seats. If I can open that correctly, we then have a USB port in there and a 12 volt power port. On the driver's side, we find a full LCD instrument cluster. This has only been very lightly tweaked for the GT500. It's very similar to what we see in the rest of the Mustang lineup. You can see that we have track apps in here, so like line lock, launch control, acceleration timer, brake performance, etc. We can also get things like our trip computer right there in the middle, performance shift indicator. You can have it uh, have a shift point right there. You can set that shift point right here if you want to adjust it yourself. 
all the way up there to just about the red line at an astronomical 7500 RPM, for instance. And now that that has been set, if we go back, you'll notice we now have that line right up there at 7500 RPM. There's some auxiliary gauge readouts, just as you'd expect out of a performance vehicle like this. Also some text display screens for things like inlet air, vacuum boost, etc. A lot of that is configurable so you can turn options on or off in the software. The basics of the steering wheel are also similar to the rest of the Mustang lineup, but things get tweaked for the GT500. We have these big paddle shifters on the back. These are really great feeling and they're nice and large. You can see that they do extend down quite far. On the left side of the steering wheel, we have buttons that control the infotainment system, volume up, down, mute, track, forward, backward. We have a button to toggle through the two suspension modes and the three different steering weights. We have comfort, sport, and normal. Buttons for the standard cruise control system, no adaptive cruise control over here. We then have some buttons that control that multifunction LCD right there along with a voice button. We then have a Cobra button for direct access into the Cobra menu in that system where you can change things like the cluster appearance, the exhaust mode, etc. Button for the nav, phone, settings button for that display as well as a phone hang up button right there. So phone pickup up here, hang up right down there. Since we're talking about a track focused vehicle here, it only makes sense to begin our drive section out here on a track. We've come out to the Las Vegas Motor Speedway where we have a road course and we also have a drag strip. We've been able to drive the model with the carbon fiber track pack out on the track here, the road track that's right next to me, and we've been able to drive the regular GT500 out on the drag strip. Now, honestly, that seems a little bit backwards to me. I kind of wish we'd been able to drive the one with the carbon fiber pack out on the drag strip because it is a little bit lighter and we have those grippier tires. So I think that would have been a better match for the drag strip. Obviously, at this point in time, we can't comment about acceleration. I don't have any acceleration figures for you at all, but I have no reason to dispute Ford's 3.3 second zero to 60 estimate. We also don't have any braking times for you, but I suspect that regardless of which version of the GT500 you get, we're gonna be talking about stopping distances under 100 feet. One of the big things that driving out here on this track has taught me is that the braking in the GT500 is probably the most impressive feature about this vehicle, period. That's thanks to the size of the brake rotors, their ability to dissipate heat, the Brembo brake calipers, and then of course, the wide sticky tires that we have on all the models. The big thing you'll notice about the GT500 out on a track versus something like a Dodge Challenger is how much lighter the GT500 feels. If you recall, I was recently at Sonoma Raceway driving the Dodge Charger Hellcat wide body. The Challenger is the two door version of the Charger. I have driven that particular vehicle. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to film a complete video on the Challenger, but I've driven the Challenger extensively as well as the Charger. And I can tell you very easily, it is just not as nimble as this Ford. Now the Ford still has a classic rear wheel drive, heavy engine up front feel to it, especially with the 5.2 liter supercharged engine that we find under this hood. So this is not gonna feel quite the same as a EcoBoost Mustang. The EcoBoost Mustang has a near perfect 50-50 weight balance. It feels very nimble, very much like a lightweight European sports car. This definitely has a more heavy aspect to it, but it's not going to feel as big or as heavy as something like that Dodge Challenger. So if you're looking for a vehicle that's designed for driving out on a road course like I'm driving on right here, that's definitely going to be the GT500. But if you're looking for a drag strip vehicle, then the Challenger puts up some pretty serious competition, especially if you're willing to pay extra for the 797 horsepower Challenger, or you're willing to start modifying vehicles aftermarket. Because at the moment, we don't know of any aftermarket packages for the GT500, but we do know that there are still a lot of tuning companies out there that will get even more out of something like that Hellcat Red Eye. Comparisons with just about anything else out there are a little bit tricky because this is more like a C7 Corvette than the C8 Corvette. The C8 is now a mid-engined exotic car in many ways. It's still a very affordable vehicle. It will cost about the same as this in the lower end trims, but it's not going to perform the same way in terms of top end acceleration. Remember that horsepower definitely gets you down that drag strip. So in drag strip or long straightaways, this is going to be superior to that C8 Corvette. But the C8 definitely is very lightweight. It's gonna feel a little bit more chuckable out on tracks and it's gonna have a very different weight balance. So if you want that classic rear drive engine up front feel, then that's what you're gonna get in this. And you're not gonna get that same sort of feel in the C8 Corvette. It's gonna feel a little bit more like a European exotic, perhaps a little bit more like an Audi R8. Out on the drag strip, the big takeaway for the GT500 is how excellent modern stability and trash control systems are. We have launch control on this, just like we have in many high performance vehicles out there. And like most modern high performance vehicles, we have a stability and trash control system that is capable of managing over 700 horsepower from this engine 
on just two wheels. I've recently had a flurry of emails asking me why is it that only recently have we had modern, relatively affordable vehicles that produce 600, 700, 800 horsepower. Well, the reality is that we are living in a moment where materials, technology, software programming, processing, etc., they've all come together into a sweet spot where they can make a vehicle like this that is under $80,000 starting, but has the ability to give us that level of performance. It has a computer on board that can actually manage the traction to the rear wheels. For drag racing like this, you really do still want the stability and trash control system on, but you want it in the drag strip mode that's going to give you the best traction and help keep you in a straight line. And then of course for track duty like we've been driving out here today, you want that traction and stability management system to let you apply power earlier exiting the corner, and that's something that we've only recently been able to do at relatively affordable prices. Back in the 80s, 90s, we just didn't have the processing ability for the car to be able to manage the traction in that way. Supposedly, this vehicle should be good for under 11 seconds in the quarter mile. However, we are at over 2,000 feet of elevation. It's also about 75 degrees out here. So I suspect most of our runs will be around 11 seconds. We have heard there's a rumor that the professional Ford driver was able to do 10.9, but this is also gonna be a good example that professional drivers are gonna be performing better than average drivers like me. And I am not a professional race driver by any stretch of the imagination, so don't expect ultra low times from me, but let's see how this goes. we have results. My best score out here so far was 11.4 seconds even with a trap maximum of 130.8 miles per hour. Now you'll notice that is slower than the quoted time by Ford, but there are a lot of things that go into a good quarter mile time. Obviously getting those rear tires to engage properly with the pavement is definitely something that you have to consider. I only had four tries. I kept bumping up the RPM for the launch control. I went a little bit too fast one time, I went a little bit too slow another time, etc. So that's why my time ended up in that range. Also remember that according to my GPS sensor, we are at 2,015 feet and it's about 80 degrees out here right now. So all of that will definitely factor into your score. That brings me to the question of can the GT500 get you the quoted quarter mile time? I think that that's definitely possible because these same vehicles out here with a professional Ford driver in them that probably weighed a little bit less than I do, managed to run 10.9 out here just a few moments ago. That means that if you had these cars on a cooler day at sea level and all the stars aligned, that advertised score is definitely possible. But as with everything in drag racing, it depends on all of the conditions out on the track the day that you're actually running. Out on the open highway with the exhaust set to quiet and the suspension in its softest form, you could be forgiven with confusing this with something like a regular Mustang GT. And that's because the GT500 comes across as very civilized and very much like the rest of the Mustang lineup. Until of course you floor the vehicle and then you get 760 horsepower out of the engine. Then you realize that you're definitely in the most powerful Mustang. But Ford chose to give this vehicle a relatively comfortable highway ride thanks to the adaptive suspension system that is standard. This is a Magna ride system very much like we see in some European vehicles. And we have that active exhaust system so you can put it into a quiet mode, make it a little bit more suitable for entering your cul-de-sac on a quiet afternoon on a Sunday. Like the rest of the Mustang lineup, we do have electric power steering in the GT500. So this isn't as communicative as Mustangs of yesteryear, but that's just a fact of modern vehicles. There really are gonna be no performance vehicles out there in this price range that will use anything other than an electric power steering rack. After driving this out on the road for a few hours, I have to say that the livability of the GT500 is what impressed me here. Because there are a lot of performance vehicles out there, especially previous generation performance vehicles, that were ultra compromised in order to give you this kind of handling performance. This definitely has a more compliant ride to it than something like most Porsche 911 models from just five or six years ago, or a lot of other alternative vehicles that didn't have this kind of adaptive suspension technology. Adaptive suspensions really have made it possible to have a vehicle like this as your daily driver, even if you live in an area where the highways aren't as smoothly polished as the road that we're driving on here. Now that said, I noticed that Ford definitely gave us some very nicely paved roads to drive on out here in Las Vegas, but some of the places in between, you can really feel the firmness of the suspension. So don't think this is pillowy soft. This is not exactly a GT or Gran Turismo style ride, but it is a little bit more comfortable than some of those balls out performance vehicles. 
When it comes to daily driving, the DCT is also very livable. So if I were just to really slow down right here, there's no traffic out on this road, and just crawl along at four or five miles an hour like you would in stop and go traffic, this feels very much like a traditional automatic transmission. And that's not something that we see in all dual clutch transmissions out there, especially some of those ones from about 10 years ago when DCTs really finally started coming out on the scene. This transmission employs a wet dual clutch design, which does mean that the transmission fluid is not going to last as long as it would in a dry clutch transmission. However, the drivability improvement is the main thing going on here. This feels very much like Audi's latest and greatest dual clutch transmissions. Bottom line out on the road, the GT500 is very, very easy to live with. It's not quite as comfortable as something like the Dodge Challenger, however, I have to say. The Dodge Challenger seats are a little bit bigger, a little bit cushier, a little bit more comfortable. That rides like a larger and softer vehicle out on the road. But if you're looking for something that's sharper, that's clearly not going to qualify. You definitely would want something like this. But I think the bigger surprise is that this feels a little bit more comfortable and a little bit more daily driver livable than something like a Camaro ZL1, which doesn't produce the kind of power that we see in this. If you want a GT500, hopefully you've been saving your pennies. These start at $73,995, including the destination charge. As with other Mustang models, this is not an all-inclusive price, so there are plenty of options to choose from on your GT500. If you want the orange paint, for instance, that's $495. If you want this stripe here, again, that's $1,000. If you want the stripe painted on rather than applied on in vinyl, that's $10,000. If you want the carbon fiber package that this model has, that's $18,500. That gets you the bigger wing in the back, the carbon fiber bits inside and outside. We get a catch can. We also get some adjustable strut mounts up front, and most importantly, the rear seat delete feature, which should make this the fastest version of the GT500. And of course, if you were to add every option available onto the GT500, you'd end up right around $107,000 after destination. That would be for the fully loaded model with the stripes, the painted ones on, the carbon fiber package, the technology package, which includes the up-level Beano sound system, all of those things together, you're definitely over $100,000. Again, comparisons between the GT500 and other vehicles out there are pretty tricky because this is quite different out on a track or out on the road than the Challenger Hellcat. But I have to say, I like the Challenger Hellcat's drive nature overall. It definitely is a little bit softer. It's a little bit easier to live with on your daily commute. It's just not as sharp, not as engaging, not as much fun as this Mustang. The Challenger falls into that sort of batch crazy category that FCA does so well. They took a vehicle that was getting pretty old, it's pretty big, it's pretty heavy, and then they stuck an enormously powerful engine under the hood. There was a time, of course, where that was available with over 800 horsepower. And as much as I love the Challenger Hellcat and all the insanity that it represents, Ford took a much more nuanced approach when creating the GT500. They went back and they redesigned the body. As you can see up front, etc., the wide body package on the GT500 looks like it was always meant to be here in this vehicle. It doesn't look tacked on like we see in the Challenger. And then there's the way the GT500 drives. It's significantly lighter than the Challenger, so it handles better. It feels more nimble out on the track. The suspension is firmer. It's more engaging. It's more easy to tell exactly what the vehicle is doing for you out out on a track or what the vehicle is not doing for you as you approach those limits of grip. And in that respect, this is much more similar to something like a high horsepower Camaro, even though the Camaro doesn't have as much horsepower as we find under this hood, or yes, even something like a Chevy Corvette. So in an odd sort of way, I suspect that when BMW finally releases their all new BMW M4, it is going to be one of the true direct competitors to this top end Mustang. Let me know what you think about all that down there in the comments section below. And if you had $80,000 to spend, what would you get in this performance category? I realize that's a very open-ended question, but I'd be interested to know what you all think. Let me know whether you would get something like this, whether you would get something like a Challenger Red Eye, or would you get something from Europe that may be a little bit slower, but maybe a tiny bit sharper than the Mustang. Let me know all that down there in the comment section below. If you haven't already done so, hit that subscribe button down there. Find us over at facebook.com slash alexandautos, Instagram, Twitter, all those other social things, and I will see you later.